Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Book of um, Zechariah, Remembered of Yah. And he does remember. But you know, we're in the 10th chapter. And in verse 1, what did he ask us to do? Ask ye of the Lord the rain in the time of the latter rain. In other words, if you want to know, let's, let's simplify that. If you want to know the events of truth that consummate the end of this age, ask the Father. He'll tell you. And then he continues on, and we're down to the 10th verse where we're going to pick it up here in a moment. His restoration of his children. That is to say, to bring in the Lord's day, whereby then people won't have to wonder what truth is. They're going to find out, some of them the hard way, and some of them the blessed way. They've already covered it in our Father's Word. So we continue then as he, he would say how he was going to bless them and lead them. But you've got to ask him. Okay, to, he said, and he said, I will answer. And um, as, in verse 6, he said, if you ask, I will hear then. Okay. So that's why you want to be sure that you talk to him. He loves you. He's your father. Okay, let's pick it up if we may then. Chapter 10, verse 10, great book of Zechariah. Let's go with it. It reads, I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of the land of Assyria. In other words, they're in the Middle East, all the troublemakers there. There he's going to gather them right out from under them. And I will bring them into the land of Gilad and Lebanon and place, and place shall not be found for them. Lebanon has always been symbolic of, uh, of correct leadership. The, it's, it's a majestic cedar, okay. Verse 11, and he shall pass through the sea with affliction. In other words, it's a troubled sea, but he's going to pass through it, okay. And this is to say Ephraim, the ten tribes, okay. And shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. In Egypt, that'd be the Nile. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down. The Assyria is the place of the Assyrian, which is to say the false Christ. And the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And, you know, you, this especially gives you the time, if you're familiar with God's uh, prophecies concerning Egypt, he promised that Egypt would always be a base nation. Always. Why then, how then can we say the scepter is removed from Egypt? Because it goes into Christ's hand. We're only going to have one king of kings and lord of lords. And Egypt is very much a part for those that believe properly. Okay. So we're coming down to that place here, the restoration, when all these events will um, transpire. So this lets you know, ask the Father concerning the, the events that consummate the end of this age. We're reading them. Verse 12. And I will strengthen them in the Lord. That's where our strength comes from. And they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. Do you, do you know what that's a Hebraism? In Genesis chapter 5, Enoch walked with God and God took him. To walk to and fro in the Lord means you're doing it his way. <clears throat> you're walking in him. You're serving him. You're doing it God's way and God takes note. It's in the book. He blesses you. He helps you. And that's where your strength comes from. He will never leave you wanting. What, what a beautiful chapter, that 10th chapter of restoration. And you must remember the first verse coming out the gate demands action on your part. But what a simple part it is. All you have to do is ask him about the events that consummate the end of this age. He will always help you and will prepare you for the events. Um, hey, when he said, 
as we come up to that gate that we will go through the sea of affliction, the Antichrist is coming at the sixth trump. These events don't transpire until the seventh, but we're going to go through it because we have duties to do there. That's what you have the gospel armor on and in place for. What he's telling you is <clears throat> that sea of affliction is, is um, frosting on the cake for us. We can cut it. Why? Because we're can-do type people. <clears throat> well, how do you know we can walk right on through it? Because we're walking with God. And when you walk with Him, just as Enoch in chapter 5 of Genesis, when, when, the, when <clears throat> Satan had sent the fallen angels and they were trying to upset God's uh, plan of salvation, then Enoch was a preacher that preached against this mixing. And he was so good at it and such a good man that God simply took him. Okay, and that's why that you want to be sure that you walk to and fro with God. Okay, then you're never alone. Chapter 11, verse 1, Open the doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. <clears throat> now this has a, excuse me, a spiritual connotation that I don't want you to overlook. Okay. Uh, what, what is the last verse in the New Testament of Hebrews chapter 12? It states very clearly that, that our Father is a consuming fire. Now, in, in actuality, and the analogy lies with, if you let uh, timber just stand on its own, the undergrowth grows up and you got so much brush under it that it's difficult to operate. But when you allow... God's cleansing fire to come in takes care of business, okay? Takes care of business. This is a natural thing, and it's, it's, um, it, it is a thing of God, and it's what it's saying here is open up in a way and looking forward to letting Messiah in. Verse 2, how fir trees, how fir tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled, howl, O ye oaks of Bashan. That's the biggest. For the forest of the vintage has come down. I mean, it is just inaccessible. It is re it's just uh, coming on down. Three, there is a voice of the howling of the shepherds. For their glory is spoiled a voice of the roaring of young lions of the pride of Jordan is spoiled. In other words, the pride of, of Jordan, that particular group, they would hang out in this underbrush that God has cleansed away. And they could hide in all that underbrush by the river and wait for something to come for water and prounce. What God has said, I've cleaned it off. There's no place for them to hide. And there's no place for a false shepherd to teach falsely. You know, um, Zechariah was a good shepherd, and he was giving us the Word of God. But many times, people do not wish to hear the Word. Too busy wrapped up in other things. Never let that be a burden to you. You simply stick to the truth and teach God's Word as it is written, as our Father spoke. And you have no problem, okay? Um, and um, verse 4 to continue. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. In other words, some of them are destined for slaughter if they're not careful. <clears throat> and we can understand then why it is written in the New Testament that when Christ returns, many will go, Oh, Jesus, Jesus, we're so glad you've returned. We've taught in your name and we've healed. He said, you get out of my sight. I never knew you. You want to be careful which Messiah it is that you're teaching. Because if you're teaching the false one, you're destined for slaughter. It's going to happen. That is to say, <clears throat> excuse me, if you worship the shepherd that comes, that is to say the Messiah that comes at the sixth trump, you're worshiping the Antichrist. You're no longer a virgin bride for the Christ that doesn't come until the seventh. 
But it's so religious. It's so, it's just church written all over it. It's just so goody goody. But it's Satan that can't be good, can it really? And, and the ultimate and the bottom line as far as God is concerned, they're destined for slaughter. And um, when, when you feed the flock of the slaughter, you want to feed with truth. You want to, this has to do with the events that consummate the end of this age. And when you fail to teach that the false Christ comes first, you are not sounding the alarm to the children. That is, that is very dangerous. But if I talk about something like the false Christ coming first, it frightens my people. Then you better toughen them up, my friend. Because if they, if they are so void of having God in their midst that they tremble, then they don't understand the Word of God. Because we have nothing to fear but fear itself because God is with us. When you teach His Word, when you feed the flock the Word of God, not the traditions of man. I mean, it is time in this generation, you better get cracking. Verse 5, whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. They'll sell them out. They'll sell your taxation and everything and sell the whole nation right down the tube. And they... And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. They don't look over them. They don't warn them. They don't warn them what's going on. And we could just rip them off for anything we want to, and they don't complain. They're good little sheep. You know, what is it that a sheep uses for protection? Let me ask that again. What is it that a sheep, or I'll say a lamb, uses for protection? It's the shepherd. Okay. The shepherd is supposed to protect the flock by bringing forth the Word of God whereby they have common sense, whereby they understand what's going down. And uh, here we see, I mean, we're reading here from the Word of God. How do they sell them? They sell their birthright and, and their heritage and try to say that um, uh, they, they take all their uh, heritage away from them or try to. They can't. Don't worry. But as far as they're concerned, they steal the heritage because it isn't taught by their own shepherds. The shepherd doesn't protect the flock. Verse 6, for I will no more, this is God speaking, I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, but lo, I will deliver the men every one into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king, lowercase, got it? Not the king of kings. And they shall smite the land and out of their hand I will not deliver them. If they won't listen to the word of God, then they can cry and whimper all they want to, God says, but I will not hear them. And again, here you've got Christ saying, out of my sight, I never knew you. Why? Because they're, they're healing and praying in the false Christ name, the one that comes at the sixth trump, not the seventh. Well, we would not intentionally do that. Oh, if you don't teach that the false comes first, you're automatically setting the trap that Satan so desires to deceive your flock. What? They're ignorant of the, of the chronological order of events that God said you better ask Him about it. If you want that latter rain, which is the truth of the end days, to fall, otherwise God said, I'm not, I could care less. I'm not going to hear you. Verse 7. And I will feed the flock of slaughter. Even you, O poor of the flock. And I look into, and I took unto me two staves. The one I call beauty, 
and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. You know, a shepherd carries a staff to tend the herd with and a club to beat off anything that tries to bother them. Okay. That's why he took two of them. Okay. One's a shepherd's hook to tend the flock, and another is a club to, to batter anything that tries to molest the sheep. Now, you with companion Bibles, you're blessed because there's a mistranslation, O poor of the flock. They've taken one word, which is to the, it's sheep traffickers. In another place in the Minor Prophets, it's translated Canaanites, which should be Kenites. Okay. Sheep traffickers means they sell the sheep. They could care less about them. God says, I'm going to feed them, and boy, am I going to feed them good. Uh, naturally, beauty translated as graciousness and bands is union. So it's talking about Messiah, the true Messiah, not the fake, will graciously unite. That's what, the, what bands does. It, it unites the family of those that do care about the word together, regardless of the sheep traffickers. Okay. Again, it's real simple. Oh, poor of the flock, though it may sound so pitiful, it's the crooks. It's the sheep traffickers. A sheep trafficker deals, sells sheep, as aforementioned, and could care less. A shepherd cares. He loves the sheep. He knows the sheep, and the sheep know him. The sheep will follow his voice, the true sheep. And that's why that um, this staff of the shepherd will come forth, and in the other hand, the club. Okay. Well, I, I wouldn't have thought the club was necessary, very necessary. Okay. Why? Well, because there's wolves around sheep uh, herds. And there are sheep traffickers that it doesn't hurt if you use the club on them a little bit every once in a while. That's what it's for. To protect the sheep. And there is a clubbing that really hurts the sheep traffickers is the Word of God to club them with the truth. The Word of God, they can hardly stand it. And they will rather turn on the messenger and try to destroy the reputation of that messenger that brings forth that true Word. Does that bother the messenger? Of course not. His credentials will take care of themselves, okay? Verse 8, three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loatheth them, and their soul also abhorred me. They, they hate God's truth. They try to remove God from our vocabulary even. I'm going to tell you who these three shepherds, they're not good shepherds. It's the priest, which is to say the preachers, not, not just any preacher, fakes, okay. pretenders. And the magistrates, those that are in office elected by the sheep to take care of them and they rend them, sell them out, overtax them, even take advantage of their grandkids. And the third is false prophets, prognosticators that billow out falseness to give the sheep hope when there is no hope in their way. God says, I abhor them and they abhorred me. Nothing gained, nothing lost. Okay. God's going to put them where they belong. You know. There are some people in this world today that need to pay a little closer attention to our Father's Word. He's ticked. Okay. He's jealous. And they better be careful how they handle the sheep. Verse 9, Then said I, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. You just destroy one another if you want to. What he's saying here, if you want to go to hell, have a good trip. Okay. 
That, that's what death means, okay? It, it means the opposite of eternal life, okay? If you, if, um, if, if you want to die, then hey, ha, go, go ahead. It's a spiritual death. And do you think God's going to sweat it? I think he just told you in the prior verse, I abhor them. Well, why would God take an attitude like that? Because of what they do to his sheep. They are granted authority and put in a place of leadership. All of those three offices whereby they could help the people. They could help the nation. But instead of helping the nation, they help themselves. They eat each other up. And how terrible it is. And what God is saying here, hey, if you want to go to hell, just go. I don't care. You know, and but why? Because he abhors them. When, once you take responsibility for something, it's, it's a charge. It's your charge. And if you drop it by faults of your own, let me hasten to say, of course, there's repentance for many things. But the fact is, when you are elected to leadership, you're supposed to lead. That's what it means. Verse 10, what's he going to do here? I mean, though those are pretty strong statements, but God means it. Okay, and, and you know what? What can you do? If somebody wants to go to hell, what can you do about it? You don't want to cast your pearls before swine, do you? And if they're injuring the sheep, good riddance. Okay, so don't 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 be all wimpy and get, feel sorry for them. Verse ten, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. In other words, there's a new covenant coming. That's the old covenant, and and. Um, what he said, this is why the house of Judah and the house of Israel are separate, okay? They're cut in two. But the new covenant is made. And when bands and beauty, that is to say Messiah was crucified, inasmuch as God divorced Israel, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, then when... He died on the cross. It gave the right in the new covenant for a new marriage. You going to be there? Or are you going to be with those traffickers? It's your decision, okay? But there's a new covenant made, verse 11, and it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock, that's to say the sheep traffickers, the Kenites, they waited upon... And the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Boy, are they going to know it. 12. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. I don't have to explain that to you because you already know. That was the price paid for Christ, for the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave. And this is what established the new covenant. Okay. And that's what God is talking about here. Well, who did he say did this? The sheep traffickers. They're the ones that, the, the Canites, Kenites that stood in that audience and said, Crucify him! That's what it's talking about. 30 pieces of silver. You can hear as Judas would go back to that temple and throw those 30 pieces of silver on that marble floor. You could hear that sound even to this day. What did they do with that 30 pieces of silver? 13. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. It, right in the house of the Lord it went. But you see, that was blood money. 
So the blood money was taken, bought outside the potter's gate. This is history. Okay. It bought the potter's field where poor folk were buried, people that couldn't afford a family funeral. And the message within that is that potter's field is where when he's making a pot and he's cooking and it gets broken and he takes the old pieces of potsherd and he throws it out in potter's field. And the spiritual meaning is that the blood of Christ that bought that field is the one that can take broken lives, those broken bowls of your, your body, and put it all back together and give it purpose, give it a life to forgive its sins and let it, let it rather than go to hell to follow the word of God to follow the blessings of God. That price was paid in bringing in the new covenant with Christ's blood. What a beautiful thing that our Father does for us. Verse 14, Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And there you have it. That's why we have two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If you do not understand that, then probably you do not have the key to David. Okay. And that is very important that you know and understand that. When you hear someone talking and they fix everything in one tribe like the tribe of Judah, then they are showing their ignorance about God's Word. They do not have the key of David if they don't know the difference. Okay, Verse 15, And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. Do you know who the foolish shepherd, the biggest fool of all is? It's the Antichrist. Okay. 16. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that are cut off, neither shall seek the young one. That's to say if somebody's starving, he could care less nor heal that that is broken, that that is weak, nor feed that that standeth still. That means so weak his old ribs are showing and just almost past help. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. And here you have, in other words, he's going to deceive them to destruction. The great apostasy. Nothing but the Antichrist. If they want to believe, if they do not understand the chronological order of events that you were supposed to ask God about, and if you listen to the sheep traffickers, the three offices, the priest, the magistrate, and the and the false prophets, then you're kind of in a heap of hurt, friend, because you're supposed to listen to the word of God. And what he's saying is, if you have the key of David, you know what price bought that, that potter's field. You know it was the blood of Christ. You know it was the true Messiah. And you have the key of David to know he divided those houses for a purpose. And that he intends to raise up a false shepherd first. What? Well, it's to check the people out. How, have you studied God's word? Do you know the fake is coming first? Because God wants to know. If you don't care enough about God's Word to protect yourself about current events, then go ahead and go where you got to go. He told you how he felt about it. He said, if they want to die, let them die. If that's what they want, have a good trip. Okay. But you don't want to do that. You want eternal life. Don't follow that false messiah. Don't follow that false shepherd. God didn't say, maybe I'm going to let him raise up. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to help. I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to check out your okra, friend. See if you've read the word of God. Now let's let him put the anvil to it here. Verse 17 to complete the chapter. Woe to the idle shepherd. Do you know what an idol is? That's something you worship other than God. And here you're worshiping the shepherd, the fake. Antichrist. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. He doesn't care about them. 
he's the head of the sheep traffickers, quite frankly. He's the father of them. The sword shall be upon his arm. Arm is your strength. In other words, the sword of the Lord is going to cut him down. And upon his right eye, he's not going to be able to see truth, certainly. His arm shall be cleaned right up. All his power is going to be gone. You want to join him? I would hope not. And his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Darkened as far as if you follow that, there is no truth, there is no light, for he is the prince of darkness. Nothing but darkness. How can one let a Messiah like that lead them because it sounds so holy? You know, the three, the three shepherds said it's the thing to do. You know, the false priest, the false magistrate, that, that's government officials, in case you don't know what magistrates are. Elected government officials. And false prophets, that's prognosticators that tell you what tomorrow's going to bring with the stock market or anything else. God says, I don't like it. But if you want to follow them, have a good trip. But there was, to, so that you would have an opportunity to have salvation, one did come, bands and the, and the union to bring forth the Messiah, the true Messiah, who cared enough that he didn't sell you, he allowed himself to be sold for 30 pieces of silver, not for himself, but for the sheep, for the children, so that the children could have salvation, could have eternal life, if they would listen to him, if they would follow him. Because this this Antichrist, this false shepherd, you know, as he will lead you and it's all dried up. What shepherd is it that you're supposed to follow? If you don't know, you should read Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You better believe it. And you better find out who that true shepherd is. He's the one that died on the cross. He's the one that leads us. He's at the right hand of God. And if you walk to and fro with God, then you're walking in God. And God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. How blessed are those that follow the Word of God. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, shepherd, or denomination. Let's don't judge people. Our Father does the judging. He does the culling, and He does the blessing. Leave all that in His hands, and you just... Teach His Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Let the chips fall wherever they may. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, we can do away with the number and the address. Why? Because God knows what you're thinking. All you have to do is, you don't even have to say it out loud. And the Father will lead you, the Father will direct you. Let's go to His throne. And um, 
give our uh, request. Father, ask him, okay? Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch. In Yeshua's precious name, amen, amen. All right, and question time. And here we have a shopping list, okay? And um, Pastor Murray, could you explain how, if it can be done, does one become an elect? How can you tell if you are, uh, well, 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 not you, but how does a person know if one is of the elect? Thank you um, uh, for the um, years, of, uh, the, the ears to hear, I guess. Bruce from Washington. I'll tell you what, um, the elect were chosen in the first earth age. So you can't decide all of a sudden that you want to be one. That was decided a long time ago by our Father. And it doesn't matter whether you're of the elect or, or a good believing Christian. Okay. It's just that the elect have duties and obligations as it is written. Um, but usually one of God's elect knows that the false Christ comes first. Okay. And knows that they have a duty to let God speak through them as it is written in Mark chapter 13 in these end times. Okay, Luann from New Jersey. Are, um, are Satan and the false prophet the same entity? Yes, they are. Okay, it's just Satan has many offices and uh, he just fills them all pretty well. He always tries to copy Christ. Why? Because he wanted to be Messiah. Roger from Ohio. Question, where can it be documented what the two churches taught, Philadelphia and Smyrna, that God approved of? Well, that's real simple. All you have to do is go to Revel uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and 3, 9. 2, 9 is Smyrna. And you notice the first thing that they taught was those that claim to be of our brother Judah and are a bunch of liars and are of the synagogue of Satan. And it's the same way with the Church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3.10 that he gives you the key of David that opens doors that no man can close and closes doors that no man can open meaning you know the generations of David were, whereby you know the true Christ, which is the offspring of David, to where you can't be deceived by the false Christ. And again, it continues as it did with Smyrna. You know those that claim to be of our brother Judah and do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. So what did those two teach that none of the other five did? None of the other five taught that uh, the imposters that claim to be our brother Judah are of Satan. Therefore, they let Satan right into their midst. And so it's not difficult at all. That is the thing that God approved of, is that the children were warned in those two churches all the other churches God found fault with, but Smyrna and Philadelphia, <clears throat> it was not the name of the church. It's the content of the teaching. Uh, Janice from, uh, don't have a state. Uh, when God made all nations or this, on the six days, were all of them men? No. No, for every, for every uh, peoples, he had male and female. He made them, okay? And, um, and was Eve the only woman? No, Eve was created on the eighth day. And it is written that Eve is the mother of all living, but not because she's the mother of all physically, but because she is the mother umbilical cord to umbilical cord of Jesus Christ, the true Messiah. And you know something? If you're not in Christ, you're not living. That means eternal life. So Eve is the mother of all who have eternal life because of the offspring of Jesus Christ and you're either in Him or you don't have eternal life. Uh, Donald from Florida, is there anything in the Bible 
regarding men wearing caps at the dinner table. My son-in-law, a minister, and grandson are usually wearing caps when they eat supper. Um, and uh, why is the fish symbol of Christianity? Because of the cipher of what it means. Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, the Savior of the world, okay? Um, and um, you've studied with me for a long time, I can see, Donald. Uh, you know something, Donald? Um, a gentleman, there, there is a very simple rule. When a gem, gentleman is undercover, that means when he's under a roof, he uncovers. Okay. That's very respectful. It's disrespectful. When you're under or when you're inside, you always uncover. And that's, um, that is, it is true that that is a military teaching, but it is also a gentlemanly teaching. And it's real simple. Anytime you're undercover, you uncover. Okay. And, uh, and so it is. When you leave that cover, then you cover. Okay. If you want to wear a hat. John from California. Uh, you know, when, when, when I, I cannot mention a minister saying the blessing before a meal covered. That just doesn't reach with me, be that as it may. John from California. I need a definition of Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, a time, times, and a half. It's three and a half times is two, time is three, and a half is three and a half years. Okay, that's what it means, three and a half. William from Georgia, I have a question about the Antichrist. When he establishes himself on the throne in Jerusalem, will he be representing himself as the Christian king? Or will he take over all regions of the earth? He, not, he, he, he um, will represent himself as Messiah to all religions. And as it is written, the whole world will wonder after him. As it's written in Revelation chapter 3. Those that do not have eyes to see. Those that do not have ears to hear. The whole world whoring after him. Uh, that's how good he is, you know. In Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 11, where the religious Antichrist appears, called the beast there, and he is a beast, looks like the lamb, but he's got the voice of the dragon because it is the dragon, Satan. He performs miracles in the sight of man that would deceive anybody. Okay. The Greek even says he can snap his fingers and lightning come down from heaven. That's pretty impressive. Okay, that's uh, that's putting on a show, and righteous folks that are righteous through the traditions of men will fall on their face and think, "Surely this is God. Surely this is the Son of God." And whatever uh, belief you might be, and I'm not going to mention any other religions, they're going to accept him as their captain, okay? Whatever they may call their captain. Because he's supernatural, and uh, he'll get it done. Okay, we've got... Um, um, Ken from California, okay? Gotcha here. Question, I've heard you say a couple of times about people being in the wrong place at the wrong time in different scriptures. I'm not a troublemaker, but I don't believe our Father makes any mistakes about anything. For He plans all things for a purpose, perfect in all. I know you have a reason for saying this, for you are near perfect. Well, I, I thought you said I was perfect. No, you didn't, did you? I didn't either, okay? Won't you let me know what is meant uh, when, you, when you're saying this. I love you dearly and a proud student of yours, Ken. Well, Ken, it's real simple. Haven't you ever read Luke 13? Luke 13 gives you the whole picture. Do you believe that those 18 people that the Tower of Siloam fell on were all wicked? Some of them were really good people. But they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
And those innocents that were caught up and slaughtered, as it says in verse 1 and 2 of Luke 13, do you think some of those innocents were, were sinners beyond any doubt? Or, no, they were innocent. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. What our Father is telling you that sometimes things happen, and they certainly do. Uh, you know, it would be, if, if we were to go by your analogy that God is perfect and plans everything to happen exactly as it does, then the next thing you know, there would be people writing you saying, God allowed my child to die in a car accident because you say he plans everything exactly as it is. And he doesn't. People are careless and things happen. This is why God wishes that we be careful, that we use common sense and we be very careful at, and, and at all times because things happen, but it's not God's fault. So you're trying to blame all troubles on God here with, with your attitude, okay? And that's, that's fine. You're doing good. Hang tough. But read Luke 13. Chapter 13, Roy from California, I, I woke early, okay, and there was a man teaching there by the name of Murray answering Bible questions. He was talking about our enemies. He said that if they would not listen to you, you might have to get a two before and beat the daylights out of them to get them to listen to you. Well, I don't think I put it quite that way, but that, that, that will let it fly, okay? I live by God's word, and I would like to know where in the Bible God tells me uh, to this to me to my to me to my enemies I read love your enemies and do good to all people do unto others as you would have them do unto you I have a lot of people I want to take it to before to but first I must know this is God's will I have my two before ready so please answer this on the air as I am anxiously waiting for your answer well we'll give it to you okay first of all you got to take it in context what does, uh, I mean, it, it is nice to be a goody-goody two-shoes, okay? Oh, yes, we just love, 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 love. I don't love Satan. God doesn't love Satan. In today's lecture, God didn't love those magistrates. God didn't love those priests. God didn't love those false prophets. He hated them. He abhorred them. So, goody-goody two-shoes, you got to be careful, but... It, love comes in many packages, it has many sizes and many forms. Let's take, you are to love your enemies. Yes, that's true. You're also, he says, to love your children. But if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Now, that's not necessarily a two before, but it is a rod of correction. Okay. And... And um, God chastises his children, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 4 through about 7. Okay. Why? Because he loves them. He whacks them. He thumps their gourd. Okay. Well, it's the same way if you love your enemy and he's got a bad habit. Let's say he's got a bad habit of killing people. Then you, you've got to give him an attitude adjustment. That is love. It's tough love, but that is love. He needs that attitude adjustment. This is what Christians get in much trouble over, is, is not drawing that line in the sand and using common sense and in following God's Word. You listen to some preacher that's a goody-goody two-shoes, and you know, he's got to be real careful because if he were to make the statement about using a two before, he might lose a member. You know something? If I lost a member because of teaching God's Word, have a good trip. I'm not hard up for students like some people are. And when it comes to teaching God's Word, and when it comes to God's love, which is tough love sometimes, let her fly, okay? Now, uh, the two before is an analogy. It means to, uh, when some wimp comes along crying to you, but I just, I just tell him to get a hold of your bootstraps, pick up yourself, and act like a man, a man of God, with confidence and hope in the Scripture, 
and, and you've loved that man and you've helped them. But if you whining along with him, oh, brother, that's the saddest thing. I, mean, I can understand why you're such a pitiful wretch because I'm a preacher and I'm a pitiful wretch too. Okay. What good is that going to do? Okay. Tough love is real love. Okay. It's loving the word of God and following it as it is. So the two before is an analogy, though, so you be careful how you handle it. Um, Sue from California. Sue, you know when you have a child that has these kind of problems, God only gives them to real special people, so that means you're real special. And I know that, that, um, that this is trying, and I know that autism is, is a, it's a hard thing. But I know God would not have given you this child if you weren't the type of person that can handle it, okay? Now, there are helps, and there, don't ever feel ashamed to take helps from, from, from um, uh, agencies that are able to give that help. But you're real special. I love you, and God loves you. You take, you take care. Dale from Illinois. I'm having trouble understanding the two advents of Jesus' return. When is the first and when is the second? If you have any tapes or DVs on this, could you please send them to me? I enjoy watching your program and I thank you for the word of God. Well, you're welcome. Uh, the first advent was Christ's first advent here on earth at his birth, okay? The first advent is past history. That's when he was crucified and after uh, 40 days he returned to the Father, okay? And that's where he's at now. The second advent will be when he returns to this earth and begins the Lord's day, okay? I don't feel we're too far away from that. <clears throat> Roy from, <clears throat> excuse me, Roy from Florida. Pastor Murray, please help me understand when we die, our spirit goes back to God. Are we judged at that time? If so, I understand the gulf dividing the good from the bad. If not, how is it decided who goes where? In the book of life, okay? In other words, um, the book of life has your name in it. You're there, okay? And all the sins that you've done that you haven't repented for are written. It's in the book, along with the good stuff. It's all right there, the record. It's like your report card, we'll call it, okay? It's like, it doesn't do you any good for some church to keep your letter, okay? Now, I'm not knocking churches, but I'm telling you, you're wasting your time with a letter in a church. It's your letter in heaven, in the book of life, that, you're, that decides. So when you pass away and when you arrive there, Father already knows if you have repented for all of your sins, then there's no sins in that book. They're erased, blotted out, don't exist, and he doesn't want to hear about it. All the good stuff, your works, is still there, okay? And you go to the good side. It's what's in the book that determines which side you go to. The judgment does not happen until the last of the Lord's day, which is the millennium. Then comes the judgment, and um, then comes the fulfillment of the lake of fire. Not until. Uh, Paul from Michigan, is Satan still in heaven, and which heaven? Where God is or where the dead people are waiting? Okay, you're, you're thinking of paradise. He, he, he's, he's behind the throne of God right in Michael's presence. Michael's got a good hold on him, okay? Michael and his angels take care of Satan and his angels, okay? They, they guard them. But uh, there's some, there is really only one heaven. I want you to know that. Paradise is in heaven. Heaven is wherever God is. But um, uh, Satan is going to be cast out of heaven before too long, as it's written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. He's coming right down here to earth as Antichrist. That's what you want to be ready for. That separates God's children from those that are deceived. That is the moment of the great apostasy. And um, that's when he tries to make a big splash. 
And he's not going to deceive us, though, but he will deceive a lot of people. Uh, Carol from Ohio, question, why wasn't, the Bi why wasn't the Bible, when written, made simpler to understand? I imagine how many more people would come to know the Lord and believe. Thank you, Pastor Murray, and God bless you and your staff. Well, you're welcome. Well, you know, you have to understand that the, the Bible was written in Hebrew, in Aramaic, and in Greek, different languages. And those languages were translated in the King James into English, okay, as well as many it's translated into Spanish and so on and so forth, okay, to all languages of the world. And it is man that translates and sometimes confuses it because if you go back to the original, it really flows pretty well. But understanding that sometimes God speaks in parables. And as Jesus would teach in Mark 13, if you don't understand the parable of the sower, who the Kenites are, you're not going to understand any of his parables. In other words, it's like a puzzle that comes together and fits so nicely. When you have truth, it, under, it is so very understandable, and it reads so well a child can understand. So you want to remember that as you uh, navigate the very scripture itself. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for studying the letter he sent to you in that matter. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.